All right, tonight's program is uh, going to be a familiar face. I really wanted to try to be tricky here and show Kevin in the camouflage, but uh, you know, my limited graphics capabilities wasn't able to do that. But I think we've kind of got a, uh, uh, a double uh, benefit program tonight between practical camouflage techniques and rate your coax. So I saw Kevin came in. Um, and Kevin, or if you're ready, I will turn the presenter o mode over to you. I'll have to find you here in the list. Um, but if you would go ahead and comment, and then I can turn it over to you if you're ready. Absolutely. I'm ready to go right now, anytime you want. All right. Uh, stand by. I'm going to make you the presenter. Sounds good. All right, should be all yours. Uh, Jim, uh, K in K four Y and A, I believe it is. Uh, you may want to mute your mic because uh, we're getting some noise off your desktop, etc. So if you would, uh, Jim, if you would mute, mute your mic, and Kevin, uh, go right ahead. All right. Let's see. Can you see the screen right now, or did I mess it up when I went to the to the other view mode? Can you see it? Or is it all gone now? I'm not seeing it, but okay, uh, I've got a bunch of cameras. You may have to share Hold your on. screen. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm sharing. Yeah. Okay, Can Jim. Now? Jim, K4YNA, will you mute your mic, please? Yes, sir. All right, now we've got it, Kevin. You got all it? Right you ahead. can see the screen okay? We got it. Excellent. Very much. Very, very good. Now, if anybody has any questions, what I'm going to do is I'll go through slide by slide. And at the end of each slide, I'll say any questions and I'll go on from there. And that way, if you have any questions, think of them because there's always going to be like a, a two second delay. Otherwise, it'll be kind of strange when we're trying to talk and talk over each other. So I will pause over those particular times. And if that's OK with everybody else, I'm going to go ahead and move on here. So my whole idea is it's kind of an extension of what I started back, if you remember, in January. No, it's actually in August, I'm sorry, of last year, where I talked about using a drone and the different techniques for putting up antennas and stuff like that. And I had at the very end, I had this one idea that I actually had put into practice, but have since gone through a lot of iterations. And uh, for some of you that I've actually talked to you direct, this antenna's been pretty good. I've got a VHF UHF antenna about 90 feet up in a tulip poplar tree. And there's been a lot of lessons learned along the way of taking pictures and, and done some other stuff. So I wanted to at least share some of those ideas. I'm gonna spark some interest in each and every one of you. If you wanna be able to do more than just repeater, there's a lot of people on Simplex 146.49. There's a lot of folks in Gwinnett County and Forsyth County and around uh, Fulton County. There's a gentleman over in Jasper who's way up high in a mountain and he's got a 59 plus 60 dB signal here in Swanee. So there's a lot of cool people that you can end up talking to uh, really expand uh, your ham friends as well. So that's, I, I kind of like doing simplex in addition. So if you live in an HOA though, you have to be able to put up antennas that they can't see. So I kind of came up with the 007 thing as far as I'm calling this Spectre, Special Product Engineering for Covert Transmit Receive Electromagnetics, otherwise camouflage antennas. So my goals here are to, this is for a VHF, UHF dual band. This is what, I mean, I've talked before about HF antennas and I'll, I have a few things I'd like to kind of go in that at the very end of the presentation. I haven't had a chance to put that into the slideshow yet, but I do have some pictures. I wanted to kind of show you some stuff there. But my primary focus here is since we have a repeater and since some people may have difficulty getting into the repeater, if you're on the, the extremes or you want to be able to get out of the repeaters, these are some cool things you can end up doing to try to extend your range. If you've got trees in your yard, great. If you don't have trees in your yard, you know, you can still get the antenna up as high as possible, but this is going to be focusing more on getting trees up, making sure they're camouflaged, doing what you can. So key thing here is I've used a Diamond X300 antenna. Let me shut this off so I can hear. 
wonderful people in their phone calls. So I've got a VHF UHF dual band antenna, Diamond X300, and it's got roughly six and a half dB gain on two meters and close to nine dB gain on UHF. My primary focus currently has been on VHF mainly because I need to replace some of the coax. When I first set this up, I had two runs of cable, which gets me into my second part later on where I'll go over uh, the coaxial cable, getting really to know your coax cable. I had some coax cable, some RG8. I thought, oh, well, this is RG8 cable. should be great for UHF, stuff like that. And, uh, and it was the right length, so I used it. Well, I ended up later on, I was wondering why I wasn't able to talk to people on UHF five miles away. It was really scratching my head. A few things happened. The antenna that I originally put up, Evidently got damaged. It was a Chinese knockoff of a diamond mobile antenna, which worked great in the beginning, but I think it got water in it, and I noticed the VSWR was you know, quite a bit higher than what it should have been, and it was acting more like a dummy load. So I took it down, and I was measuring the coax feed, and I found out on UHF I had 20 dB of loss. 20 dB. Now, for those of you who don't deal with decibels a whole lot, Put it this way, if you put 100 watts into the coax and you lose 20 dB of signal, you're putting out one watt into the antenna. So I went from 100 watts to one watt. I burned up 99 watts in the coax, heating it up rather than heating up the air. So one of the first things I did is the one section that goes up the tree, it's about 75 feet. I replaced that with a section of LMR 400 that I happen to have and reduced that loss, which was 10 dB on UHF, it was about 4 dB on VHF 2 meters, and dropped that down to about 1.5 dB. And that made a world of difference. And I'm waiting for some of this pandemic stuff to go away so I can invest a little bit more. I'd like to go ahead and get a full 175-foot section of continuous run of LMR 400. And I'll go over some of the different types of LMR 400 that I've done some research on as well later on in the presentation. And that'll drop my loss down considerably, especially for UHF. So I got this great antenna. It's a dual band. It's got lots of gain. But if I'm not getting power up to the antenna, A, I'm not transmitting very well. B, my receiver loss is going to be tremendous as well coming back down the feed line. One of the other key things I wanted to make sure now, I've, I'm very good with a slingshot. And I was able to put up several different ropes up this tulip poplar tree over some of the, the tallest branches on it. And so I need an antenna that can slide up through the tree branches and make sure that it doesn't get caught. So this particular antenna had three element, three counterpoise elements, like ground plane radials on it. However, being that this type of antenna is two 5 h wavelengths in phase and series, it doesn't really need a ground plane. The, the counterpoise is there is to decouple the antenna from the coax feed to help your VSWR. That's essentially what it is. So first thing I did is I took my, I've got a little antenna analyzer that actually sweeps any frequency and it works from one to 230 megahertz. So I swept it from 144 to 148 and held the antenna up as high as I could out in the nice clear area where I wasn't getting any type of decoupling. I'm sorry, any type of loading from any metal objects or anything else. It was all set nice and pretty. So I had the counterpoise on there, measured the VSWR. It was great. Took the counterpoise elements off, same, no difference whatsoever. So for me in this particular application, I'm going like, okay, I got the antenna I need. Prior, prior to that, I had a twin lead J pole that I had used, and I did have a little bit of a, a coil at the bottom of it, very small. And it was small enough that it was able to go up through the trees. But like I said, it was a J-pole. It was only for one band. I wanted this to be dual band. As well, I needed to make sure that because I wanted to slip this antenna up through the tree branches, I couldn't have my decoupling coil like I usually would have with a, a coax, about six turns of coax on the bottom of it, because that can easily get stuck. So that's another reason why I wanted to see how well this antenna would decouple without that type of loop. And it, it did well. It needed something durable, and this has the fiberglass radome, so it's uh, it's already weather sealed pretty well. It's very strong, diamond, good quality brand. Comet makes a similar one. There's some other ones as well. So I my first tree branch that I hung it up actually was more towards the center of the tree, and I didn't seem to have any problems with the VSWR loading or antenna pattern change because I was talking to people all over the place from it. But when I 
had issues with it, had to pull it back down, put it back up. I had another rope that was a little bit further over to the side, and you'll see pictures of this later on, that it has it a lot more in the clear. So this is a much better system to be put up. So, And I did some testing and hitting repeaters from all over the place. So I'm pretty amazed with it, just with this current coax system. And once I replace the RG8 cable that I've got buried in the ground, I'm going to replace it with LMR. I've got conduit under the ground, so it's pretty easy to, to replace. Uh, then I'm really interested to see what kind of coverage that I'll have with it. But the key thing is I need to make sure this is uh, not going to be visible from the front of the house, which is why I do the camouflage method. And I'll go through some of the iterations of that. Uh, a lot of my coax feeds as well going up. I make sure that I spray paint them so they kind of are camouflaged. Black isn't bad to begin with, but you camo them, it's even better. Same thing with the ladder line I got to my 160 meter doublet. I've spray painted that kind of brown and uh, camouflage colors, and you can't even see this thing going up the tree. It's wonderful. So the coax cable, besides the antenna being hung from the tree branch, I've also got the coax separately. It's the same rope that's pulling both of them up, but I've got two different ropes. The one that's the tighter rope is connected to the coax feed, but not to the connector. It's a little bit below the connector with a hose clamp, and you'll see some pictures of that later, because I wanted to make sure that that connector was not uh, supporting you know, the weight of the whole coax and pull it out. Because I did have some issues where the, the, uh, the rope that I was using, which is uh, paracord, it does stretch a little bit. Uh, and what had ended up happening, I had type N connectors originally and they pulled out. And I'll go over that whole deal about the pull strength of a type N connector versus a UHF PL259. Considerable difference between the two and my reasons for doing this more mechanical than electrical. Anybody have any questions before I move on to the next slide? Yeah, I've got a, I've oh, got go a question. I, I'm not seeing the slides. I'm st I seem to be stuck on your antenna project goals page. Oh, that so, was what? where I was. That That's... Oh, okay, that so you've been... Just, okay, I thought you were describing the slides you were showing. Oh, not yet. Okay, anybody else? Very good. So this is the antenna that I started with. As I mentioned, it's a Diamond X300. It is white fiberglass. And I'll go over some other stuff later on, but I wanted to throw this out real quick. It turns out that Home Depot sells similar antennas from a company called Tram, and they're only 50 bucks. So if you want to have yourself a nice dual band antenna, for 50 bucks, you can't go wrong. Now, I picked this one up used, and I got a really good deal on it, so that's why I was able to use this one. But uh, I found this to be a, a nice radiating antenna. It it works really well for me. But it is white, so that's where, you know, I had it up on the tree, and I'll show you some pictures of what it looked like with the white antenna up there. And it's not bad, but without any leaves on the trees, it's quite a bit more visible, so you'll be able to see. Anything before our next slide? All right, moving on. So here's the tree that I'm talking about. Uh, I don't know. Can you see my mouse as it's moving across? You probably can't. Yes, we can see it. Oh, you can see it. Excellent. Good deal. All right, so this is the tree. So it's a 120-foot tall tulip poplar tree. And I have got a rope that goes way up here. You can kind of see my 160. No, actually, that's the... That's a rope for another antenna that I've got. But I've got a 160-meter doublet that goes way up here and, and crosses over. In fact, the ladder line, and I can kind of see a little bit of it there. But this is originally where I had the antenna, and then later on I moved it over to here. So you can see here's the white antenna. This is how it looks there. It uh, was very, as you can see, it's right next to the center trunk of the tree. You got the coax down here. I've got some close-up shots so you can see it definitely, it stands out. It's not bad, but it does stand out. All right, next picture. So type N versus UHF or PL259 connector. There's pros and cons to each of these. A type N, definitely for VHF and especially for UHF. I mean, type N connectors are made to go up. Some of them are 11 gigahertz. Some of them are more the fine tolerance ones or 18 gigahertz designs. Not that most of us use those frequencies, but still, 
if you want a good 50 ohm connector and something that is designed to be weather sealed, a type N connector is definitely that. The problem that I had, and I'm going to back up one picture here, the way I've, whoops, ah, the way I have this thing hanging up an antenna, by the way, somebody's got a microphone unmuted. I'm hearing all sorts of noise in the background. If you see where this one, you've got the antenna hanging down here and the coax is hanging straight down. And I do have a rope and a clamp holding this up, but trees do swing around and this coax cable, there's a, quite a bit of weight to it pulling down. And that's where the issue becomes if there's any type of give on this rope, it can pull on this connector. So with the type N connector, the problem is the center conductor, if you ever put a type N connector together, the center conductor is soldered on to your, the center pin is soldered on to a, a center conductor of your coax cable, and then it slid into the Teflon bead that's inside the outer conductor of your coax connector. And it does not have any barbs or anything to grab it. It can slide in or slide out. The only thing that really holds mechanically the type N connector is the actual uh, back nut for the crimp, a clamp type connector. I do not recommend a crimp on type type end connector, uh, especially for outside use. It's just, they're a much weaker connector. Uh, if you're not going to have it outside, it's probably okay. But if you're going to have any type of pull strength on anything else, uh, that's what happened originally. I had some of the cable connectors were, they may have been a manufactured connector from cable experts, but they were a crimp on type for the outer conductor and it just pulled right out. So not good. PL259, though it is not really a UHF connector, it is not really meant to work on those frequencies, not adequately. It does provide an impedance bump there. It is not a 50 ohm connector. But for this case, since it's such a short little section, I'll deal with the uh, any type of VSWR issues. It's going to be a lot better than having a connector that mechanically pulls out and fails when I've got it up the tree. Um, it does require additional waterproofing, unlike the end connector, which has a gasket in the very rear. So it is designed to be IP67 capable, which is a, a water method where you should be able to put the connector in one meter of water for uh, one minute, not have any type of intrusion. IP, IP68 is going to be 24 hours. And those are some really good commercial connectors that do that. But typically, we don't have our connectors in submerged in water either. I would hope not. And I also avoid the crimp type of PL259. Excuse me just a second. So the PL259 mechanically is a pretty solid connector, and I'll show you the reasons why here. This is what happened with one of my LMR 400s when the cable pulled out from the connector. This is what was left. As you can see, the only thing really holding it on is the braid. And that just slipped right out. So that was gone. Anything more before I start on this next group? All right. So uh, here's just, go ahead. just one comment. Uh, I, used, I was 20 years in the Air Force in communications. And yes, uh, for VHF and UHF, they use the end connectors exclusively. Oh, I agree. It's from a, an RF perspective. It's a great connector. I'm saying for my particular operation, because I need something mechanically that's not going to pull out, that's why I'm using a PL259. That's the only reason why. But I totally agree with you. For any type of commercial applications, any rugged applications where you're not pulling down on the cable, the type N connector is definitely the way to go. Totally agree. This here is a specific application. Any other questions before I move on? All right, so here's a cross section of a male and female type N connector. You can see there's the center conductor, and right here, the center conductor, this is the piece that's soldered on to your center conductor of your coax cable, represented by this section. And right here, this is the Teflon bead, the main Teflon bead, and there's another little Teflon bead here. Oh, don't do that. <clears throat> there's another Teflon bead here that's got a little bit of a dimple, and not all of the type N connectors actually look like this. Uh, there's a lot of them from Amphenol and some other companies that are just plain smooth inner conductors that just slide right through. Nothing is holding them on. Uh, it's only the outer conductor that holds them on. So 
For a PL259, however, if you notice, there's some barbs here on either side, right here, here, and if anything, it keeps this center conductor from pulling backwards toward the back of the connector. So once you solder this inner conductor in here, this is not pulling out, and it's not going to pull out in the back way either. When what I'm trying to do, I'm going to have strength pulling back. Whoops, I keep clicking that. Sorry, guys. Uh, it's going to be pulling back in this direction down toward the back end of the connector. So you can see here this bead is encapsulated by the connector walls, and this uh, center connector here is encapsulated. This isn't going anywhere. As well, if you take a look at the inside of the back end of a PL259 connector, you've got these threads, and they thread right into the outer jacket. Now, if you've removed the outer jacket, well, you're going to lose some of your water proofing and you're also going to lose a lot of mechanical strength so you need to keep the jacket up to this particular point and that's typically if you look at any of the uh, connector instruction videos and, and just instructions in general on how to put a PL259 onto an LMR400 cable or a RG8 cable this is what you end up doing to make sure that you've got uh, a good grip here so for my particular application, what I'm trying to do is uh, have the connector uh, hold the cable vertically and not pull out. Very specific application here. Any other questions? All right. Kevin, are you able to see the chat window? There's been a couple no. of comments over there as well. No, I can't see the chat window. Okay. So go ahead. If you, if somebody um, wants to unlock and talk, go for it. No, I just see a couple of comments. One was from uh, Tim WK4U. He said the wireman sells a cable strain that works great and solves the cable pullout problem. And I'll be going over that one. I've got one of those too. So hopefully it's the same one that the wireman has. Yeah, go on. That looked like that was really. There, there's a couple of comments, but uh, go ahead. Doing great. Okay. Okay, no problem. All right, so a type N male connector. This is a typical amphenol, as you can see, this inner conductor here, it's smooth. There's nothing that's gonna hold it, it back. And the main part of uh, what's gonna hold this in place, you've got the shield that goes over this metal piece right here. The shield comes out here, wraps around, and then it compresses against the inside of the connector through this clamp. You've got a gasket here to keep water out, and you've got this washer that pushes the back of this coupling nut onto this gasket to help seal this whole piece in here. So that's the majority of your actual strength or any type of linear pull strength from this connector. And now this particular connector, this is available from American Radio Supply from Pan Pacific, but if you use these guys, I use them quite a bit over in Augusta, Georgia. Great prices, great product. This one has an extra bead right here that goes on the back side with this insulator in here this inner conductor is not going to pull out. It's going to end up stopping right here. And that's also this insulator here is also stopping on this piece, which stops on the back side of this coupling nut. This is a much, much stronger connector. So this one would have a lot more pull strength than the amphenol connector. I found that to be kind of interesting. So if you still want to go with a type N, I didn't have one of these yet. I did buy one since then. Um, and I could probably try that out to see what kind of pull strength it is. But when I uh, probably when I replace the whole uh, cable with one continuous run with no jumpers or with no connectors inside, just a continuous run of LMR 400, 400, then I'll try one of these connectors and we'll see how strong it is. I may do some pull strength ahead of time just to see what kind of uh, uh, strength it truly has. But by design here, this looks like a a much, much better, stronger design to keep it from pulling out. And maybe that's what the Air Force uses, something very similar to this, because I've seen these before. I just haven't seen them lately with the amphenol connectors. So PL259 cross-section, you saw the, the piece that was actually broken apart before and cut the pictures. This is kind of showing you the same thing. There's the inner conductor with the barbs that actually are in the Teflon bead inside here. And the same thing, you've got your threads that are on the inside that are meant to grip the cable jacket. So 
for those the gentleman who made the comment about the uh, the strain relief, if you want to open your microphone, is this what? Uh, since I can't see the the comment section on here, is this what you were talking about? This type of Chinese finger trap design. I'm not seeing a response, Kevin, but I, that's what I've seen from the wireman as well. Okay. Yeah, this is something I saw later on after I, I've got just a regular hose clamp. I don't really like it because it digs into the, the jacket. This is temporary until I get my new cable that I'm going to get one of these and put that on there. And this will, this will take and reduce the, uh, the strain from one particular point. Also it keeps you from cutting the rope because that stainless steel clamp uh, I think over time is going to end up damaging this paracord, cutting into it because it's a sharp corner. So I think that's going to be a fault condition later on. So eventually I'm going to replace all that. This is what I'm going to end up using as well. What I've done with this particular situation, I've got one paracord that goes up and down the tree. And at this particular point, I've tied a bowline in this particular spot and then continued with the rope the rest of the way down to the antenna. And then this section is another rope that uh, ties on from the top of the antenna to this piece here. So currently it looks like it's taut, but it really the way I've got it set up right now, it isn't. I hadn't tied it yet to the bottom here. This is actually the one that's more tight than uh, the top section, because I want to make sure this rope that's at the top here is holding the bottom of this, whoops, it's holding the coax and not the antenna, because otherwise the antenna, if you use the antenna to hold everything up, it can damage the antenna and pull it apart. So I don't want to do that. So yeah, this is the uh, the clamp that I plan on using. And if somebody's got even better clamps or anything else like that, by all means, speak up now. Any comments? All right, moving on. So how I have the antenna clamped, what I end up doing here, this is the bottom of the antenna. This is where the counterpoise elements actually screwed into it one time. So it makes a good point that uh, it doesn't pull on the fiberglass radome at all. It grabs the bottom of the, the antenna itself, and that's where the main support is. I've ended up tying some like clove hitches that wrap around here, and they it's uh, it helps to keep the antenna vertically positioned. If I was just holding it from the bottom as I'm sliding it up to the tree, you know, it can you know, fall all over the place. But what I end up doing, I, I wrap it, wrap it, wrap it as I go up the antenna until the very top. And then I just use some electrical tape at the top here. So that way, when I'm pulling the rope up, it's keeping this right to the center of the rope and not catching. Otherwise, if this rope was dangling down below, this would have a tendency to split and then get caught on some limb or something like that. And then you couldn't pull it up anymore. So I just do that so it keeps it all streamlined. Any questions? All right, camouflage paints. Now, Rust-Oleum and Krylon, and there's some other ones that are out there, but these are readily available at Home Depot, Walmart, Lowe's. And I found that they really didn't cover the type that I was really needing, not completely, because they don't really, this is more for camouflaging a boat or something else, or guns or some Jeep or something. But when you're trying to blend in and match the color of your trees in your yard, you need some different colors as well. And I found that not only did I use some of these flat colors, and by the way, they need to be ultra flat, so you don't you don't want anything glossy or even matte finish as well, but you want something that's flat. And it turns out, although this one did say matte, it still works out pretty well. But this particular color, this brown, provides a nice offset, and you'll see that when I show you some pictures later on where the uh, the gray was just a little bit too light and the browns are just a little bit too dark and the greens just didn't really quite cut it. The blending these different colors with this brown really made a difference and shows the two-tone nature of the actual bark of the tulip poplar tree. So there's all sorts of different colors that you can end up uh, using and it's, it's gonna be depending on what type, type of trees you have in your yard. Pine trees are gonna be very much different. So every one of them's, uh, you got to blend in. 
So what I did here is and I had a power problem with the link itself causing that kind of problem. I can barely hear you. Can you start over again, please? Is there a problem that the paint may have some metallic substance in it that will affect your antenna? Well, these particular paints, I haven't found that to be true, but yes, there are some paints. That's why I don't mess with metallic paints. Guaranteed they have metal flakes in them. If you look on the ingredients, you can see whether the pigments themselves will have, you know, metal in them at all. Uh, but I've not found this to be any type of problem. But you're right, that's something to definitely keep uh, track of to make sure that it doesn't, you know, cause any type of issues. But I haven't seen any issues with this at all. Hey, Kevin, it's uh, Dave, W4DTR. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I had gotten a great suggestion, I believe from, it was MFJ, who suggested that whatever spray paint you buy, spray just a little bit on a piece of paper, pop it into the microwave after the paint, you know, after the paint dries, obviously. Sure. And give it, you know, give it a few seconds in the microwave. If there's any metallic, you know, bits in the paint, you'll It'll find out immediately. No, that's a great point. I forgot about that. That is a really good point. And I probably ought to do that. Maybe I'll follow up. And in fact, I will follow up and take some of these spray paints and spray a piece of paper and put them in a the microwave and see what happens. I hope the paper doesn't catch on fire. So that's a good point. Yeah, well, don't nuke it that long. No, 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 not <laughs> that long. I, I know I usually do that with PVC pipe. And there's certain PVC pipes that you know you don't want to use anything with dark pigment stuff like that, like the electrical pipe, you don't want to use that. You want to use a very thin white pipe for a radome. And even then, that will still detune a Slim Jim antenna, because I've had experience with that, where I had one and it dropped it by about three megahertz, where I'd originally tuned it and put it in the thin wall PVC uh, pipe, three quarter inch, and it, wow, it detuned at three megahertz. So that can be a problem. Uh, but I did check the VSWR afterwards, so that would be a good indicator as well, before and after painting it. I didn't see any difference in the VSWR. It didn't shift it. It didn't really do anything. So I, I think I'm probably okay on this. That's another indicator. But yeah, I'll, I'll take some of this and put it into a uh, microwave and see what I get. Good point. Anybody else? All right, Dave, your audio is awesome, by the way. I wanted to let you know. Thank you. Yeah, I have a, a USB microphone I got from Amazon for 20 something dollars and I've had good reports with it. Oh, it's very good. Very clear. Clear Thank audio. You. All right, so let the painting begin. What I did is I have a, a dog run cable that goes out my backyard for my dog. So I just hung the antenna from that horizontally. You can do whatever you want. Uh, but I just wanted to hang it horizontal so that way I could sit there and rotate it and uh, while I'm painting it. So it was able to easily do that, and, and uh, also it kept the kept it off from discoloring my grass. I had it high enough where it wasn't sitting on the grass, so I didn't spray paint my grass. But at the same time, since this is a nine foot long antenna, if you had it sitting vertical, then you're gonna have a harder time trying to get to the top and bottom of it. This just made it a whole lot easier. So after that, I got the first application, then I rotated it, and you can see how. Now the, the paint is now on the bottom, and now it's time to paint some more. Anything else so far? All right, so continuing to paint, and now you can see it's really starting to blend in. So here's the white, very noticeable, but the dark here is really starting to blend in with some of the wood that's here. So it's really starting to take effect. And there I am complete with this one, and I've the thing is, it's not a single coat of paint. As you notice, it's different colors. So I've got some of the gray paint in here. I've got the dark brown as a base. And then I've also put some green, camo green on it. I mean, I've done some different colors that basically, you know, what's in my yard? What's our, what, are, what colors are representing the trees in my backyard? And I just wanted to make sure that it blended in with that. And not so much with the leaves, because the leaves are only there six months out of the year. I wanted to make sure that even during the winter time that this antenna is just not visible. So I wanted to make sure it really blends in with the tree trunk. Which leads me to the next picture. What I did next is I then, there's my dog run right here. I tied the one end of the antenna up because I didn't want to spray paint it against the tree. I'm probably about 50 feet away from the tree in this particular case. 
want to kind of get a bird's eye view. Okay, I'm looking at this. How does this match up with the tree trunk? It's not bad, but this gray is just much too light. So I didn't really like it. So I started spraying over some of the gray with a little bit of green. And then I added a little bit of the brown. You can see some of the brown showing up here and eventually a little bit more. And it's getting much, much closer here. It's not as prevalent. You can see here in this picture, I think it's a lot more visible in this picture right here. It's blending in a whole lot better. Any questions? All right. So you can see here how well it blends in. So I was doing some final touch up in this area here. I wanted to go ahead and touch up a bit more and I did. Uh, but there's kind of how, in fact, there's a close up view, how it all kind of blends in. And you can see some of the different colors that are in the tree trunk itself that kind of, you know, give all these different colors here. Any comments, questions? All right, moving on. So the new location, this is the original location where I had that antenna when you first saw it. And it was around the main trunk of the tree. And I had another rope that was up here going over a tall branch. So I ended up moving it over to that particular branch and you'll see what it looks like here. Now you can see there's where you can kind of see the coax going up. And the antenna is way up here and it's just, you can hardly even see it. Then I zoomed in on it and you can now start to see there's the base of the antenna and the antenna is going right up here and just kind of gets lost within the leaves and everything. Everybody see that okay? All right, show you some even more close up pictures. There's more of the antenna. You can kind of see it now as I zoom in even further. Thank goodness I have a good camera that's got a good optical zoom on it so I can really grab some good pictures and stand in the right spot. But uh, you try to find this otherwise, I found it pretty difficult to find. You can see the ropes going up here. And then this final picture here, you'll see there's a rope holding the bottom. It's also holding the uh, coax itself down here. And then the top of the antenna, you can see the rope up this way and this is it blends in pretty nicely you can't even see this and this is up this top section is about 85 90 feet up in the air and there's the the rope continues to go up it goes over some taller branch i could probably pull it up another foot or two and then there's the down rope coming back down that holds it so i may end up pulling it up another foot or two but i don't think it's going to matter uh not going to make any difference in the range or anything two more feet big deal I'll just leave it where it is. Questions, comments? All right, so here's the antenna. This one right here, this is the Home Depot antenna you can get for about 50 bucks. It's a tram model 1480. And this is the original antenna that I tried previously and I had actually, this is a, a Diamond 7900A. Runs about $90 maybe a little bit more at HRO. And like I said, I picked up a Chinese knockoff, which lasted for a little while. And I just won't spend that money again. But what I ended up doing the camouflage it is I took heat shrink and over each of the metal sections, I wrapped heat shrink and shrunk it up and covered up all the silvery sections. Worked like a charm, covered it up. And uh, I did the same thing where I wrapped the rope around the different sections, especially around each of the larger points here. So wrap the rope in a clove hitch pattern so it held the antenna up nicely and took the strain off. The beauty about this particular antenna, it's got a UHF connector at the base. It already mates with an SO238 or a double barrel female if you want to go ahead and have a, a UHF female coupler into the base of it that you can end up hooking a PL259 right up to the bottom of it. And that's the nice thing about this one. And it can slide, it doesn't require a ground plane slides right up through the trees, easy. This antenna right here from TRAM, I have a feeling that you probably can remove the ground, the uh, the counterpoise radials, and I'll bet you it's still gonna work. This is most likely two five-eighths waves in series. Comments, questions? All right.
that's it for that part. Now I'm going to go on to the Know Your Coax because some of the things that I learned, lessons and everything along the way with this one, is I just assumed my coax was, just because it was RG8, it was going to be great for UHF. Not. It really stunk. So there's different types of coax vendors. And it, even though it may be an RG8 type, I'm sure you remember the old Radio Shack days when oh, avoid the Radio Shack cable. Probably great for CB. Lousy for UHF. And if you take a look at it, you'll see a lot of the reasons why. It depends on the dielectric that's being used. Uh, your best is going to be an air dielectric. A lot, lot more expensive cable, although the 9913 is probably the closest thing you'll find to somewhat of an air dielectric cable without going to the corrugated or the rigid cables. Uh, Teflon is very common, very good, low loss dielectric. Foam is another one that you'll find in a lot of good products, such as uh, the Andrew and Comscope cables that are used commercially. You'll find that as well. Polyethylene, uh, you'll find the, I'm trying to think, the LMR 400, that's also polyethylene. There's some poly, and I wouldn't say styrene, those are used for some other type of air dielectric, but there's some really crappy type of polyethylene that's out there that is very, very lossy. But the LMR 400 is a, a really good you know, cable and the foam cables, the less air you have, and that's the nice thing about the foam cable, it does have it's a lot of air bubbles in it. And that's why it tends to have a little bit less loss. The velocity factor is a bit different. Um, but that's one of the key things uh, for losses and for other types of items that will affect your loss will be the shield type. Your 100% shield types, LMR 400 being that it's got a foil shield, followed by... Uh, uh, I also read the brief, sir, Calvary. Uh, it goes to the board. Uh, it goes to the board. Doug, it's RX, please mute. Second, for endurance riding, and third, for stadium show this. Doug, can you go ahead and mute, please? Person like 400. Doug, KB6RRX. Can you please? Quickly. And what's the battle of those? Wait a minute, Forrest. You are right. Kevin, let me see if I can do this. Sure. Now they get to deal with Final Jeopardy. Subject? Hey! And the question is, what type of shields are effective at reducing your cable loss? So LMR 400's got 100% shield versus uh, some of the other ones, like the old Radio Shack cables. I really question whether they had, hold on a second, let me shut this off. All right, for the LMR 400 being that it's got 100% shield because it's got a, uh, a foil shield, and it also has a tinned copper braid. And it's real important, for those of you who've had any type of aluminum and copper interactions outside, you want to make sure that copper and aluminum don't touch each other when there's water and moisture around. So, But tin and aluminum get along fairly well together. So that's why any time you have aluminum and copper touching each other, you tin the copper and then they can touch each other. So you'll find that LMR 400's got tinned copper wire as a braid, and that's what you, that's what allows you to be able to solder that to your connector, because you can't solder to aluminum. So the aluminum foil is what provides your 100% shield. The tin soak braid is what allows you to be able to solder to whatever connector you're gonna end up applying to your LMR 400. Uh, some of the other really junky coaxes out there have anywhere from 60% to maybe 80% braided shield. Your better ones have 95%. Belden's got really good uh, coverage, and that's what's really going to help you quite a bit with your loss. Believe it or not, single conductor versus multi-stranded center conductor I found during my LMR 400 analysis, which you'll see later on. There's definitely a difference between the two, and it makes sense because if you take a look at how impedances are calculated, and I'll have a diagram of that, it's your inner conductor, diameter, and versus your outer conductor inside diameter, that is a, a mathematical uh, constant that forms your impedance. If you change any of those parameters, you're gonna change your impedance. And with a multi-stranded cable, you're gonna have a variableness on your center conductor, your uh, inner conductor as we call it. 
and that will end up changing your impedance ever so slightly, which will affect your losses. And frequency, of course, is one of the key factors. The higher you go in frequency, the worse your loss. And that's just the nature of the beast. Any questions about this page before I slide on? All right. So water is the main enemy of any type of coax. You want to make sure you do not get water into your coax. So the jacket types, this is more the mechanical side of it. You want to make sure you have a jacket that if it's you're going to have an underground, make sure it can handle direct burial and you know got good water uh, resistance. If you have some that's going to be sitting outside for a long period of time and handle sunlight, you need to have a jacket that is UV resistant. You have anything that's not, after about a year, you're going to find that that jacket is cracked, water's inside, your coax is dead. Uh, it's just not going to work whatsoever. So you need to make sure that you've got a UV resistant jacket. And some cables are actually submersible in water. They can handle that submersible in oil and other things like that. A lot more expensive cable. And then, of course, you've got some cables that are what are called plenum rated cables that are fire retardant that you can have up in the commercial buildings. And if anything catches on fire, it will not produce any type of toxic smoke. Center conductors, if uh, they're definitely more solid, they have more consistent impedance, but they're stiffer to play with. But if you're going to have a permanent installation and you're not going to be moving around, that's probably a better cable to go if you're really looking to you know, reduce your impedance losses. And also, they tend to be a little bit cheaper in price, as you'll see in a little bit. Uh, the stranded cables are more flexible, and especially if you're for field day, multiple uses, stuff like that, that's definitely the way to go. And a lot of times, you're not going to see a huge amount of difference, especially for HF, you're not going to see the difference there. Uh, it's negligible. So your bend radius is something you have to consider. Different types of coaxes have different types of bend radius, and it has a lot to do with uh, not only the diameter of the cable, but it has to do with the internals of the cable. If you have something like a polyethylene, which is a pretty hard uh, dielectric, uh, your bend radius, uh, as you bend the cable, the impedance is going to be fairly constant. You're going to find your foam dielectrics, though, as you bend them, beyond their bend radius, your impedance is going to change and you'll end up screwing up your lawsuit, you get more VSWR issues with that one. Uh, your air dielectric cables like 9913, you really want to make sure you don't bend it because actually if you bend it too much, you change the distance that the center conductor is on the inside of the coax to its proximity to the inside of the outer conductor and you will change your impedance. And I've seen it before, you'll get all sorts of impedance bumps and everything else that can really mess you up. So pay attention to bend radius. Make sure you don't have any really sharp bends in your coax because that can cause you some losses as well. Any comments? All right. So I mentioned here, as far as the what determines impedance of a coaxial cable, you've got your inner conductor, and there's the outer diameter of the inner conductor. That particular radius, and then you've got your outer conductor, the inside diameter or inside radius of your outer conductor, and that is what is determining your equation as far as your dielectric as well. Whether you're using air dielectric or Teflon or some other type of material, those combinations together are what determine your impedance. Any changes to any of those mechanical dimensions or your dielectric constant? will change your impedance. I got a good example. Back when I worked at a company called Spinner, we made jumper cables uh, commercially. And there's two different types of cables. We had what is called the Superflex cable, which is a spiral outer conductor. And they call it half inch, but it was really not. It was a little bit smaller diameter. And then there's the LCF model, which is a linked type of outer conductor. This is all solid outer conductors. Commercial quality cable used in cellular telephone industry and commercial land mobile radio. And this one antenna company had created, they needed some uh, phased match cables created. And they did their calculations based off of a, what is called an LCF or the linked type of outer conductor, which can only be adjusted in however long the lengths, lengths are, which is typically about, oh, maybe four, three to four millimeters a piece. So if you want to change your phase, you're going to have a big jump in phase because you're going to have to change over every little valley or every little peak uh, of that particular coax. 
whereas for phase match cables typically use the spiral type that you can get down to the tenth or hundredth of a millimeter and really get fine tuning. So they had designed their antenna around the LCF cable, which had a different dielectric constant than the Superflex cable, uh, 82 versus 88 percent dielectric constant. So when we built the cables for them, they didn't specify what cable. We thought that, oh yeah, they're going to use a Superflex cable because you need something that you can get a really tight phase. And we were able to get like plus or minus one degree really, really tight. They were looking for plus or minus five degrees. So we were able to exceed that quite a bit. When they got the cables, they were physically short. And they were scratching their heads. And then I asked them, well, what kind of cable did you base your stuff off of? And they told me the wrong kind of cable. I said, well, there's your problem. You need to base it off of the Superflex type cable with that particular dielectric constant. And then you'll have the cable length correct. So there is a big difference with the dielectric constant when it comes to determining these cables. It really will have an effect. If you take the broadcast industry, they have an air dielectric rigid line cables, and they make sure that there's there's dry air inside of them. So they're constantly either pumping pressurized nitrogen or they have dry air that's going through desiccant material and pumping it in there. If you get any type of moisture, A, you'll have arcing. B, you'll change the dielectric constant of your uh, your air inside there and it'll change the impedance and you'll get some losses and heating up. And it'll just mess with the transmitter and antenna system quite a bit. Any questions before I move on? All right, so here's some of the different antenna cables. You see here on the, the right side, you got the LMR cable. There is the aluminum shield. Ah. Don't do that. There we go. There's the aluminum shield, 100%. And then you've got your tin copper braid that goes around there. And of course, then you've got your jacket, polyethylene jacket. And it's a solid center conductor. They do have a version of LMR 400 that is stranded, so it's more flexible. And here's your typical RG8 cable that's got the multi stranded center conductor. Sorry, it's the European spelling or the English spelling or the Canadian spelling as well. Uh, then you've got your dielectric insulator here. And this braid, that's probably know, anywhere 90, 95%. Pretty decent looking braid. You've got some other ones here, like for instance, RG8X from ABR Industries. I specified this one because as you'll see later on, I'll show you how well this cable performs. It may be RG8X, and a lot of RG8Xs that are out there typically look like this. It's just, you know, maybe it's a foam dielectric. Uh, but it's got like an 80, 90 percent braid, and I would really would not recommend it for long runs, at, especially UHF. But this RG8X, you'll see that it's pretty impressive. It works very, very well. 9913. Now this is not 9913 here. This is another type of plenum cable. You see, there's a white jacket here. Uh, this is a corrugated cable used in the commercial industry. But the 9913 cable, and I couldn't find a cross-reference of it, but it's very similar to this. It's got mostly air, and it's got a little bit of this ribbing of the polyethylene, or sometimes Teflon, uh, that keeps the center conductor right in the middle of the outer conductor, so to maintain its uh, constant impedance, even when bending to a certain point. So that's why it's got some really low loss. Any questions? All right, moving on. So S parameters. For those of you who have heard about them, I know there's a lot of you guys out there that work with them, but for some people who like S parameters, what are you talking about? Or you'll see something that'll refer to VSWR and they'll say S11, or especially they've got those little nano uh, VNAs that are out there. You can pick one up for like 90 bucks, 80 bucks, 70 bucks from Amazon, eBay or whatever. A lot of people are using them now. My boss has one of them he kind of plays around with. They're great little devices, and they'll uh, work to a pretty high frequency, but allow you to do some really good antenna analysis, transmission line analysis, and stuff like that, and be able to hook it up to your computer through a USB port and do essentially the same thing as one of these expensive ones do, but uh, for amateur applications. And they usually come with a little bit of a, a calibration kit that comes with a short load and an open that you can calibrate these different ports which you have to do to uh, whenever you set up a vna so a vector network analyzer allows you to be able to 
uh, send a signal from one port to another port and or sometimes just send a, a signal out here and also receive on the same port or vice versa, depending on how it works. You've got two ports here and that's what the S parameters refer to. There's an S, in fact, you can't really see it right here, but it kind of does show you in this diagram. Uh, but port one and port two are what you see here. And when you refer to the S parameters, S11 refers to I'm connecting and for my transmit and also looking at my receive right on the same port. But if I'm going looking from path loss from port one to port two, that would be considered S12. So if you're gonna do look at VSWR, sometimes it's called return loss from some folks. Um, that's just strictly looking at either S11 or S22. Same thing, you're actually spitting out a signal and looking back and seeing what your reflected versus forward power is on a vector network analyzer. Works a little differently when you have a VSWR meter. Uh, you're actually looking at both the transmit and receive path at the same time. Same concept, uh, but you're using your transmitter. In this particular case, the transmitter is built into this device as well as a receiver, and it's syncing both of them up and looking at those signals. What we're gonna do here as far as judging your jumper cables to see how good or how bad they are is I'm gonna be doing a path loss measurement and using a VSWR meter instead of a VNA, which I've got one of these at work, but I don't have one of them at home. And a lot of people don't have them, so I'll show you a much simpler method. Uh, any questions before I leave S parameters? All right, so as far as the different cataloging, I wanted to really find out where my cables, what kind of condition they were. I really needed to, to understand because like I said, I wasn't, this one cable, when I had the antenna up so high in the tree and it was working fine that all of a sudden later on, it just wasn't working well at all. Not only the antenna go bad, but the coax itself was crap. And I just started piecing this uh, one part at a time, just took a look at the coax cables and measured the losses. When I found that I had 20 dB of loss through the 175 feet of cable, I knew I'd found my problem. So I wanted to replace the bad cable. So I wanted to go through and find out, okay, what are my different cables? Which ones are good ones? Which ones are bad? Which ones can be used for HF and some other ones as well? So some typical things, whenever you end up making a jumper cable or if you happen to have one that you've bought and you wanna go verify, or one that's just sitting on the shelf for a long time, you wanna see the condition, there's several different things you wanna look at. First is the continuity from center conductor to center conductor, make sure that it's not open, because that'll hurt you. Uh, if you have a poor connection, something's broken in the meantime, and uh, maybe there's some stress on that cable, and now that uh, center conductor pulled out from your connector, doesn't work anymore, that'll definitely cause some problems. So measure your continuity. Also look at the, make sure there's no short circuiting from the center conductor to the ground, either because when I soldered the connector, I, there was a little whisker of a wire from the braid that happens to short out to the center conductor, and it's happened. I had to cut the connector apart, or cut the connector off and put a new one on because I didn't do my job initially. Those are some things to look at, making sure that you don't have any short. And I mentioned here static versus dynamic. Most people check out just static, it's just sitting there and measuring the continuity. But I found that if you end up uh, hooking the cable up to some analyzer, whether it's your rig or something else, and then rotating the cable right behind the connector, if it turns out you have a poor connection, the shield is not connecting properly, you're going to see your VSWR in this particular case, or your short, your, your own your resistance, you'll see it intermittently changing around. This is especially true when you do VSWR type of loss or even loss measurements uh, when you actually do this, what we call dynamic testing. I did that at Spinner because we had to have cables that were not only electrically solid, but were mechanically solid because they were gonna be mounted on towers. There's wind, rain, ice, sleet, snow, everything else that the post office deals with. That these cables have to last. You don't want tower climbers going up and replacing bad cables. So we would end up taking these jumper cables that we produced in our factory and then also doing dynamic testing on them. We rotate the connectors around to make sure that the back of the connector was a good solid connection. So same thing with VSWR, make sure you do your static and dynamic testing. When you do VSWR measurements, make sure you have a good 50 ohm non-reactive dummy load, basically a pure resistor, something that will give you a good VSWR, good 50 ohm 
with uh, no reactants, inductive or capacitance on there, and there's a lot of available units that are out there. And then the cable loss measurement is the key thing that I was looking at. That's what I'm going to be doing. Oh, in just a moment. Uh, just some different things that I've used for my cables. I have these. I uh, found these tie wraps, twist or yeah, zip ties that have marker places on them. Found them at uh, Home Depot. Lowe's didn't seem to carry them, but Home Depot does. And there's some other places that have them. And you write them on with a Sharpie marker, and they work out great. I also picked up some of these wire, this wire marker book. I'm going to be marking some other cables. And then when I put them all together, I use these Velcro, Velcro straps. You can pick up at Lowe's, Home Depot. Walmart carries them. They're cheap, and boy, they're nice and reusable, and they work really great. Uh, rather than using like electrical tape, which once you're done using that, it gets the tape, it gets your coax sticky with the glue, and then it's only one time usable. These are reusable over and over again. And you can wrap them such that they actually will tie onto the cable itself and will stay there. So when you're done rolling it back up again, and I forget who the gentleman was who put together that great uh, coax uh, roller, the one that puts it into a nice, nice coil again. Uh, you can end up using this again at the very end to tie it off in several different points, and now you have a nice bundle. Any comments about this before I move on? All right. So as far as measuring cable loss, two things that I am doing is uh, I take the rig, whether it's a VHF, UHF, or HF rig. Uh, the different frequencies I use are 28, 50, 146, and 446 into the dummy load. So the first time I hooked up and set the power to a particular level, then I got a nice uh, reading, <clears throat> fairly full scale on the watt meter. Hook up the coax cable between the watt meter and the dummy load, take that measurement, record it, and then I swap locations. I move the dummy load to the other end of the cable so I can see what the output power is. So just for instance, that 10 dB cable loss, I had 100 watts going in, I had 10 watts coming out. Amazing amount of cable loss. So I don't want to see that. I want to see where I'm putting in 100 watts and I get like 90 watts back out of the other end. That's more the beauty. Any comments? Questions? All right. So anyway, I took the information, put it into an Excel spreadsheet. So I labeled all of my cables with a particular number, described it put the vendor down. This type of deviation, is just, this is for RG8, this is for LMR, this is for RG8X, and that was useful later on when I go to plot it. I used a formula within Excel that actually put this stuff together so I could identify what cable is with which line. Uh, but you see here in the loss, I have the input power, output power, and in here it determines my actual loss in dB, and there's the formula right up here. And you can pull that off the web, pull that out of the AWRL handbook everywhere else. Uh, but that has taken this and it determines your loss over the different frequencies. And you can see here, you know, 1.32, 2.18, 3.98, 10 dB. So this this cable was the one that I was using. And it stinks at UHF. Horrible. So anyway, it uh, I was able to get this thing working out pretty well. So then I took this raw data here, and then this is just for that particular length cable. I actually measured each of these cables to see the exact length. And then I ended up transposing that down to this table, where then I uh, scaled the actual measurement to be, here's the loss per 100 feet. And from there, I was able to determine what this particular cable had a 13 dB loss per 100 feet. And some other cables, depending on the, like the LMR types, if you look at the Times LMR, 3.5 dB loss per 100 feet. Some other ones, these are short cables, so they're not going to scale exactly the same way. But this cable here, this was 25 feet long. I've got another LMR that was, well, the 50-footer actually is up in the air. I don't even, I'll have to log that later on. But what I ended up doing this, I then plotted this into a chart. You can easily see now the LMR cables, those are represented by the dashes. And you can see how good they are from 28, 50, 146, and 446 megahertz that the LMR cables are pretty good. But remember I talked about that ABR cable? That's this cable 
this dotted line right here. Look how good that cable is. It's even better than some of the RG8 cables that are out there, not even including this piece of junk. But this table right here, this is Belden. This is cable number four, so it's Belden RG8. And in some cases, the UHF, it was better than the Belden. Now, at the lower frequencies, it was pretty comparable. In fact, in HF, uh, this is even, uh, whoops, back up. At HF, the uh, RG8 was better. Strange how that happens, but it just does. Uh, but I was really impressed with this ABR cable that you can get from HRO. And this particular one, I believe this is 100 foot. So that's cable number 11. Cable number of them. Yeah, yeah, that's a 100 foot cable. So that's true 100 foot loss. It's not scaled or anything else. I'm really impressed with that cable. So the LMRs are all up here with these dash lines. And this dotted line here is RG8X. It's typically what I expect to see for RG8X at the higher frequencies. Down in the lower frequencies, not a huge amount of difference between RG8 and RG8X. They kind of waffle around depending on the manufacturer. Any questions on this page? Just a comment. I think that's a very good idea of measuring all your cables so you know exactly what you have. Thank you. That way I can. I need to have something. I'll grab it. I'll grab this particular cable for a certain what I'm trying to use it for VHF, whatever else, or uh, some other cables. I may say, you know what? It's time to throw this in the recycling bin. Like this cable here. It may be long, and I'll probably use it for HF, and that's it. I'll never use it for VHF and UHF again. Any other comments? All right, so LMR cables. I started looking at that, stranded versus solid conductor, prices and everything else. One thing I wanted to bring up here, there's this company called, um, oh, uh, Antenna, I think it's Antenna Farm. And they've got a warehouse based in Blairsville, Georgia. And they've got, this is called TWS 400. I looked at it and it's not a Chinese knockoff. It's but it is an LMR type of cable, and I've looked at some of the specs of it. It appears to be pretty good, but it's 79 cents a foot, which is uh, pretty reasonable considering the LMR. And these are this 99 cents a foot. This is from HRO, so they have a pretty good price compared to some of the other companies as well. But that's if you see the solid is 99 cents, whereas the LMR 400 UF this is the flexible. It's a buck 49. So. It's a lot more expensive to go with the stranded center conductor than the solid. And for what I'm trying to do, I'm going to run it through a 90 degree bend, an electrical bend, a PVC inch and a half conduit. The solid goes through that just fine. It bends nicely. So it's not a, a real sharp radius to begin with. So you can see the different prices here. Uh, this is Comscope, CNT. Uh, there's just all sorts of 99.13. I looked at it. It's comparable to LMR as far as the price. Um, and there's the flexible 9913. You'll see it's 10 cents more a foot. So I took this and I measured. They did a scatter plot where some of them use some frequency ranges, other ones use other frequencies like ham frequencies. Some of them do uh, 50, 100, 400. Some of them use the actual ham frequency. So I used a scatter plot to plot these. And this is what you end up getting side by side. You see the stranded. As you go up in frequency, of course, it's going to you know, get up. These are the same scale. But the solid conductors, you can see, they have slightly less loss than the stranded. And they have a lower cost as well. So for me, when I go to get my uh, long run of LMR, I'm going to get the solid center conductor. It's cheaper, and it's got less loss. So for 100 feet at 400 megahertz, we're talking less than 3 dB, about 2.5 dB of loss. And so you're talking about not even 5 dB of loss for 200 feet. So I'm, I'm happy with that. That would be a heck of a lot better than what I was getting earlier. So these are some cool websites that I'll provide this information to you, uh, <clears throat> Randy. So I'll shrink this down into a PDF so that way we'll be able to email it. Uh, and there's a cable spec list that I've got as well that shows all the different attenuation charts and everything else. And there's a bunch of them on the web. Uh, but this kind of has a whole group of them that they pulled together. And then just for fun, if you want to see a monster antenna farm, there's a gentleman who moved from Hawaii to 
just north of Pensacola, Florida, Molino, Florida. He's got this monster antenna farm. That's the view from Google Earth. Now it's the airplane, but he's put, this is a four square, 160 meter antenna system, steerable array. They're all 140 foot tall, round 25 towers. He's got some monster stacked, uh, three element beams or six of them stacked on this one right here. You can kind of see the stack is going up. Take a look at this guy, his website uh, that's on QRZ, if you've not heard of him. That's an impressive antenna farm, just really impressive. So for me, I am done. Any other questions anybody has? That guy is not in a deed restricted area. <laughs> no, he's got five, and believe it or not, this is five acres. So he's got a lot of stuff on five acres. I'm impressed. But you go through his whole story, his website, his QRZ website, it's an amazing story that he's got. I mean, he's got inch and five eighths inch cable going from his ham shack out to each of these antennas. And just the massive, I swear, he must have spent a million dollars. The house itself is only, it's a third, well, 2,300 square foot house. Not real impressive, built many years ago, but the, he bought the place for like, I want to say, was it $250,000 back in 2013? I guarantee he had to have spent a million dollars with all these antennas. He's got four different TS-990 rigs right there in his shack. Those are 8,000 bucks a piece right there. It's just amazing. Go take a look and drool. <laughs> I think you'll have fun. Any other questions? Well, I hope we've encouraged y'all to take a look at your trees, hang some antennas up there, uh, really have some fun with it. Take a look at your coax. Don't assume just because it's RG8, it's good. It might be garbage. Uh, Everybody pretty much has a VSWR meter. If not, uh, you can probably borrow one from somewhere, uh, a power meter, and go take a look at your uh, coax. See what's good, see what's bad, replace it. But uh, don't make the mistake I did and put something up that had 20 dB of loss and then wonder why the antenna is not working as well as it should. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. This is K4GTR.